Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this public meeting of the House of Lords Committee on Food, Diet and Obesity. Uh, we're today holding the seventh evidence session of the committee's inquiry, exploring the role of foods such as ultra-processed foods yeah. and foods high in fat, salt and sugar in a healthy diet and in tackling obesity. The committee will continue taking oral evidence over the coming weeks in order to inform its detailed report to be published later this year. We've also published a call for written evidence, which is open until the 8th of April, and that can be accessed on the committee's website. We hear today from Nikita Sinclair, the interim head of the Children's Health and Food Programme uh, at Impact on Urban Health, and Julia Thrift, Director of Healthier Placemaking, uh, Town and Country <laughs> Planning Association. They're both joining us in person. And by Alice Wiseman, Director of Public Health at Gateshead Council, who's joining us remotely. You're all very welcome, and we're looking forward to your evidence this morning. And I will be asking you to briefly introduce yourselves the first time you speak to answer the question. Uh, today's meeting is being broadcast, and a written transcript uh, will be taken for subsequent publication. It will be sent to the witnesses, just to check in case there's any inaccuracies. I refer to the list of members' interests, including my own, which are published on the committee's website, and we set them all out in the committee's first evidence session on the 8th of February. Now, before we hear from our witnesses, I'd like to repeat what I said at the start of the 7th of March evidence session, very briefly. Uh, while it would be inconsistent with Lord's Committee procedure to compel our witnesses to do so, we will, for the sake of transparency, be giving our witnesses the opportunity voluntarily to declare any interest that they deem relevant to the work of the inquiry the first time they speak. So having said all that, I'd like to move to the first question. And that is, how do local environments affect diet and rates of obesity? And what role does deprivation play in these? So, Julia, would you like to go first and introduce yourself first? Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Julia Thrift, and I work at the Town and Country Planning Association, the TCPA. The TCPA is a charity. We work nationally and, and beyond the UK. And we campaign for a world which has homes, places and communities in which everyone can thrive. Um, I don't think I've got any other interest to declare, thank you. Uh, um, moving on to the question, um, I suppose my area of expertise is the built environment, the way it's planned, designed and, and managed. And if we go back to the Foresight Report on Obesity, uh, which is now 17 years old, um, uh, it, it talks about obesity being caused by an imbalance between uh, energy consumed and energy expended. Um, it, there may be other factors. We're now hearing more about things like sleep being possibly connected um, to obesity. But I'm going to stick with the idea that um, it's a fairly simple equation about calories in and energy expended. And the Foresight Report talks about um, two ways in which the built environment might contribute to that and it's about places that make it easy and attractive for everyone to be physically active and there's a lot that planning can do to shape places to make it easy for people to be active but that's not what your committee is interested in um, and it also talks about the way that planning shapes the food environment and if you look at the Foresight Report, there's the very famous diagram of the many, many, many influences on obesity, the, the spaghetti diagram. And I think what I'd say is that planning is perhaps two strands of spaghetti in that huge bowl of spaghetti. And one of those strands might be physical activity and one is around diet and food. So changing planning and the built environment isn't the silver bullet to creating a better food environment but it has a role to play, and if you're going to take a whole systems approach to tackling obesity, planning is something that needs to be considered, even though its role is perhaps a fairly small one. And thinking about um, the role of the built environment in shaping the food that people eat, we could start by thinking about people's homes. Um, the homes that are built in this country are some of the smallest in the world. Um, and 
Uh, the, in, in 2019, the Royal Institute of British Architects um, did some research and suggested that more than half of the new homes built today are too small for the needs of the people who move into them. We do have a nationally described space standard, uh, which is a, a modest standard for the size that new homes should be, but it's voluntary. It's not mandatory, and many councils particularly in areas of low land values, would really struggle to make it mandatory because developers would be able to say we can't afford to do that. <coughs> now, one of the impacts of that is that if people are living in very small homes, um, often nowadays you, you'll have a new home wh where the kitchen is a corner of the living room. And in worst cases, it might just be a microwave in the corner of the court for people, if they're able to buy fresh food, fresh vegetables, to cook from scratch... Because if your kitchen's tiny, you can't store the fresh food, you can't store the utensils. It, you, if you batch cook and you haven't got room for a freezer, you can't freeze that food. So the homes we live in are something to consider. Um, we at the TCPA are campaigning. Um, we think that all new homes should be of a quality that will support the health of the people who will live in them. The homes we built today will be with us for decades, if not hundreds of years. Generations of people will live in them. So um, we can start with the home. Then moving out of the home, there's the local environment, and planning shapes things like whether or not there's space for food markets, um, whether or not people have gardens, whether there are allotments or community gardens where they can buy, uh, grow food. And, and those things may not solve people's... They may not provide all the fresh fruit and vegetables that people need, but they normalise the idea of growing food. They normalise the idea of growing and eating fresh food. So they also help with cultural change. Um, and one of the things that I think I'd like to draw to the attention of the committee is that the way the built environment is shaped is determined by national planning policy, the national planning policy framework. And in that national policy, um, food and health aren't mentioned until paragraph 96. Now, planners have to balance all sorts of different things when they're making their decisions, and, and national planning policy reflects this. There's the economy, there's the environment, there's jobs, there's transport, there's schools, and so on. But we think that um, planning policy should place a much higher priority on creating places where it's easy for everyone to live a healthy life. And we think there should be a statement at the beginning of planning policy that says uh, planning should create places where people can live a healthy life. And it should, it should also help tackle health inequalities. It has a role to do that as well. Now, English planning policy doesn't even mention health inequalities. Many other national planning policies, such as the Scottish and the Welsh, do, and they see that planning has a, a role in helping to tackle health inequalities. Mm -hmm. So because English planning policy is quite weak, it, I mean, it does mention food, it does mention health, it does mention allotments, but they are low priorities. And that means it's quite an uphill battle for councils that want to take a strong role in tackling mm. public health issues such as obesity, because planning inspectors will say, well, that's just one of many, many, many things. Um, why are you focusing on that? And that means they have to provide an enormous amount of evidence. And it's, so it makes it an uphill battle. Thank you very much indeed. Perhaps we could go to Alice next. Local authorities have just been mentioned. Yeah. Do introduce Thank you, yourself. Chair. First. Um, I mean, just to, to start by saying I agree with everything that the previous speaker has just said, um, but I'll, I'll also go back to the fact that we've seen, as you will know from all your evidence gathering sessions over the last um, few few weeks, we've seen a massive increase in the uh, overweight and obesity across the population since the 70s. And for me, my starting point is it's not possible for a whole generation of people to lose willpower at the same time. And actually what we need to start thinking about is the population measures that we can take to address this as an issue rather than always thinking about individual interventions. And I think that's a real key point here. Um, you know, um, we know that the environment around us influences the choices that we make. There's so much evidence that's emerging now um, around greater exposure to ultra-processed food associated with higher levels of consumption. There's also some great 
examples of practice such as Transport for London that has reduced the promotions and the impact that this has had on reduced um, reduction in household calorie consumptions. You know, but this needs to be addressed, like I say, in a population measure rather than focusing solely on individuals. Um, I think in terms of inequality, you know, we know that this is a really significant issue, both within local authorities up and down the country. The most deprived parts of our communities experience the highest levels of overweight and obesity. And this is largely driven around, you know, the price of, of food for the for these communities. So healthy foods are three times more expensive per calorie than unhealthy foods. Um, sorry, than uh, less healthy foods and energy dense foods of poor nutritional value are much cheaper. Um, and, and, and in spite of all of the issues that we've got around the cost of living crisis, you know, what we see is that people who are in more deprived communities tend to spend about double the percentage of their of their income um, compared to those parents who are in more affluent um, communities. So price is a really important um, issue in terms of the availability of, of food. I mean, data from our local national child measurement program shows that this is absolutely the case. And some of our most disadvantaged communities, up, up to half of our children are overweight by the time they leave primary school. You know, this is not a case of families, you know, sort of not caring about the food that they're providing them with. But a group of families in Gates said that we did a long piece of research, a year long piece of research with said we are more concerned about our children going to bed hungry than we are about what they are, are eating. So I think we can't underestimate the impact that we have on of, of price. And promotion's also another huge issue. You know, we see that 40% of sales in food come from food promotions. And actually, we know that food promotions are more likely to be those unhealthy food choices. Yeah. Um, and we know that people are using this as the cost of living crisis by in the buy one, get one free offers, when in actual fact, buy one, get one free, the majority of that is consumed as additional calories rather than allowing people to manage their, their incomes and manage their budgets. You know, so we need to think about population measures. We need to think about price. We need to think about promotion. And we need to think about availability of healthy and unhealthy food if we're really going to tackle this as an issue. Thank you. Alice, you were so keen to get into the nitty gritty there that you didn't tell us about your oh, role sorry. with Gates Head Council. Would you mind just for the record? Yeah, no, sorry about that. So I'm Alice Wiseman. I'm Director of Public Health in Gateshead and actually soon to be Director of Public Health across Newcastle and Gateshead. Um, I'm also the Vice President of the Association of Directors of Public Health, which is a membership organisation. And so I represent the members' views of, of this as an issue rather than just my own views as, as Alice in Gateshead. Thank you very much, Alice. So Nikita, would you like to give us a brief introduction and then turn to the question? Yeah, sure. And first, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I'm Nikita. I work at Impact Urban Health, and we're part of Guys and St. Thomas's Foundation, which is one of the largest health foundations in the UK. And our work focuses on, focuses on making urban areas healthier places to live. And I currently co-lead our programme looking at the relationship between children's health and food. And I guess um, to answer your question about local food environments and deprivation, I am going to be echoing a lot of what's been said, in particular by Alice. But I really, I guess, want to um, focus on the fact that what we've learned from our programme is what surrounds us shapes us. And actually, for children in many areas at the moment, they can't access the food that they need to thrive. So to give you a, like a really tangible example of one of the boroughs that we work in, in, our, um, in South London, Southwark, if you take two neighbourhoods, Camberwell and Dulwich Village, which are less than two miles apart, a child growing up in Camberwell, which is a more deprived neighbourhood, is almost three times more likely to live experiencing food-related ill health than their, um, than their neighbour in Dulwich, which is the most affluent part of Southwark. And I want you guys to, I guess, imagine what it's like for a child living in an area like Camberwell, which is more deprived, so when you leave your house, you are genuinely up against a flood of unhealthy, cheap food options, and there's barely a trickle of healthy, affordable food. So whether you're on the food shop with your parent, going to a convenience store, which we know are disproportionately relied upon by low-income families, or in the supermarket, um, you know, Alice has mentioned how healthy food is much more expensive, but you're also seeing a saturation of cheap and healthy food options, and at the same time, 
you are being bombarded with advertising in your local area which is telling you that these products are made for you and that they're tasty and that you should be eating them and they're putting them center stage in your mind then on the way to school we've done some analysis in our boroughs and if you're um, on the way to school in a more deprived neighborhood you might pass up to 17 fast food takeaways and in the immediate walking vicinity of your school there might be about seven fast food takeaways now taking you back to Dulwich Village which is the most affluent part of the borough you might pass seven takeaways and around your school there are no takeaways then when you get into school it is down to chance at the moment whether you'll get a hot nutritious meal so I guess all of this is to make it really clear what families living in low income areas are up against um, and yeah, for the rest of the session, really keen to focus on what government can do because there's lots of solutions that you've heard previously and you're here today and, and yeah, really want to shine a light on those. Thank you very much indeed. Can I move to Baroness Ritchie for the next question? And thank you, Lord Chair, and you're all very welcome. And if I could start with Alice and go that way. Um, in your view and the view of your association, what are the causes of unhealthy local food environments and what role does the food industry play and you can focus I suppose on costs lack of culinary and skills and access um, to cooking tools and cookers fridges refrigerators because I think Julia referred to the small house and the small space in which people sometimes have to cook in stress and time poverty and actual poverty and other types of inequality and anything else you would like to say? Yeah, so I think probably it's emerging over the last few years that recognition of the commercial drivers of, of ill health and unhealthy food being one of those those commercial products alongside tobacco, alcohol, gambling. Um, you know, so when we're, we're thinking about those things, you know, the, the industry does play a really significant role in shaping our environment. You know, as the previous speaker spoke about, we are bombarded by messaging from industry. We know the vast majority of marketing material is on unhealthy, ultra processed food. And we know that that, that, that is, the billions of pounds spent on that is spent for a reason, which is around you know, in 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 the interests of the commercial interests of private sector uh, private sector partnerships, we do know that there's a really significant issue around. You know, there's around ten sort of top uh, food manufacturers um, across the world, and actually the majority of their products come from us eating this unhealthy food. So it is within their interests, understandably, for them to maintain the status quo. And actually what we see happening is we see these, these food producers um, promoting research that they have funded that, you know, is, is conflicted by the interests that they have. You know, we see that there were um, evidence around public sector, private sector partnerships actually favouring the commercial sector objectives and particularly thinking about the focus and role around personal responsibility. You know, so a lot of that is 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 um is supported by this industry narrative. Um, we also know that the food companies spend the majority of their marketing money promoting foods that are unhealthy. Um, and we know that the World Health Organization in 2022 found that there was a link between, you know, the level and frequency of um adolescents' exposure to food advertising and consumption. So we have all of this evidence in, in front of us, and we know that the industry has a real strong role in, in promoting the maintenance of this and in, in increasing the availability of this unhealthy food. We know that unhealthy food is cheaper to produce, it's easier to transport, it's easier to, you know, to, to keep and to sustain. And so we know that families in our most disadvantaged communities are often being pushed into a position where they're not able to make some of the choices that some of our more affluent families are able to make. And I refer back to the research that we did in our most disadvantaged ward in, in Gateshead, where the families said, you know, we know the food that we're feeding our children is not necessarily of the healthiest choice. We don't want our children to be overweight like we are, but actually we are really concerned about them going to bed hungry. You know, so there is a real significant driver in terms of poverty that is pushing people to use the products that are being promoted made available and placed in, in you know, into in, in terms of the, the price availability. We also know that more disadvantaged communities have less access to good quality, high, you know, sort of high, high, high healthy foods. 
Um, and we know that, that all of this is kind of is is impacting in, on individuals and families and those choices that they're able to make. So for me in public health, I think we're just coming into the front, front where we're starting to think about those commercial drivers. It is different. But if we look back at the work we've done on tobacco since the 1960s, you know, 1962, when the Royal College of Physicians first published their report linking tobacco and um, and uh, cancers, actually, there was a big pushback from industry. Yeah. What we've seen over the last few decades is that as we've restricted the marketing and promotion of those products, people have been able to make different choices. And I think that that's where we need to get to with all of these commercial drivers of unhealthy products and particularly thinking about food. We want to make food more affordable for people in more disadvantaged communities, but we also need to ensure that the food that we're providing them with, you know, is that is 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 that that is it healthy and nutritious. It is not OK that we've got kids that are overweight, but malnourished at the same time. And actually, the economic drivers of doing something around this is you know at the moment it's costing about 58 billion pounds to our economy to address the issues of overweight and obesity so actually there is a real economic driver in the broader sense around taking action on these issues but i really think we need to protect health policy from the commercial interests of industry and we need to accept that where things have been done in a voluntary capacity such as uh, you know the, the voluntary codes that actually they're not effective whereas the things that we've seen effective and where they've been regulated. So for example, the soft drink levy, we saw a massive reduction in sugar content, but that was because it was required and there were fiscal measures put in place to ensure that industry adhered to it. Thank you. Um, you like to, uh, hello, um, Alice. Sorry, I, I can see you. you may not be able to see me. I ran uh, the London Food Board for a long time and we had a big problem about companies like Coca-Cola wanting to sponsor playing fields. And on the yeah. whole, we tried to resist, but it was complicated because you were up against a borough that had a zero budget. And what do you still see? I mean, I feel anxious that, or very worried, the association of sport, health, Red Bull, Prime, Coca-Cola at the Olympics, you know, we go into this. Do you see that? Do you get those kind of pressures in the council? Yeah, and that's a massive issue. And that's why some of these things need to be tackled nationally rather than locally. So you've got a real challenge when you're in a local authority, like you say, with very limited resources, balancing the benefits of having, you know, the World Cup or something, you know, played within our within our area against the, the sponsorship of that particular thing. And, and there is a balance that needs to be taken within local authorities at the moment. Does the economic benefits of having something, you know, outweigh the, the potential challenges and risks? What, you know, where we see this work is, is places where they've taken this on at a national level and that they've looked at reducing the subsidy and sponsorship, particularly of sports sports programmes. And I absolutely agree with your comments on, you know, actually there was a big driver with particularly Coca-Cola and other to link themselves to sport and to say that we can have an energy balance if we, you know, we can eat all of this food and drink all of these drinks, provided we take exercise at the same time. Well, the evidence that we're seeing come, come through now is suggesting that this is not the case. Mm -hmm. And that actually, whilst exercise is really important and really good, for your mental health and well-being is not a significant driver um, in terms of overweight and obesity, and it is our food environment that needs to be addressed. And, and it's like, like I say, it would be great if there was stuff done at a national level to help us do this locally. Can we go back to Baroness Rich's question? Uh, maybe Nikita could provide us um, with some information about the causes of on uh, local healthy food environments and also in the role of the food industry, and you're particularly looking at the impact of urban health. So if you could give us something about that. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, a lot of what I will say really echoes what Alice is saying. I think the first really important point to make is that this distinction between local and national food environments, I think that's a false distinction. So, um, you know, we might have local independent convenience stores, but these are often stocked by national wholesalers you might have a local supermarket, but the decisions are made nationally. And then you've got global food and drink businesses who are frankly flooding these shelves with cheap and healthy food products. Our partner Bike Back did some research with Oxford University recently that showed that these food and drink businesses are making the majority of their sales in the UK from unhealthy food products. In fact, four of them is more than 75%. So I think would encourage the committee to understand that whilst you know we live in local areas there are national and global interests that are shaping what we can access and uh, the cause of this is a food system that doesn't incentivize food industry to prioritize children's health <laughs> and 
you know, the good news about that is that we can do things to redesign the food system, to redesign the incentives so that we can prioritise children's health. And I guess one of the ideas that I'd like to speak to you about today um, is, I guess, there's two kind of roles that government can play. One is fostering innovation. We know that there is an issue with the flow of healthy, affordable food that's designed to meet families' needs, particularly those living on low incomes. You know, at the moment, there's 8,200 food and drink businesses in the UK, and since 2018, only 450 of them have been able to secure investment. So there's untapped potential and a role that government can play in encouraging that innovation by providing small grants and support to accelerate and support those products to scale. And we've um, kind of demonstrated how this can work through our Good Food programme with Mission Ventures. And then on the other side, super, super important, Alice talked about this already, is regulation, signalling to businesses that child's health is important, and whether that's um, through taxes that support reformulation or through um, kind of requirements for businesses to improve the proportion of their sales from healthier products. Like the, I guess the, the big point is that government have a role in reshaping the incentives that food industry are working within, and that will have a big impact on local environments. Thank you. And Julia, and maybe you could concentrate on the areas that haven't been referred to in terms of this question, the local food industry and the environment. Yes, thank you. I've less to say about the food industry. I think other people um, have more expertise in that. Um, in terms of shaping the local, local environment, um, you can buy unhealthy food anywhere. You can buy it at the petrol station, at... Uh, yeah, in hot food takeaways, but you can buy it all over the place. Um, planning, planning has a role to play, and, and the built environment, but if you like, it provides the stage. It doesn't say who the actors are or what the play is, if that makes sense. So planning, in a very crude way, can make decisions around hot food takeaways, but it doesn't say what food is going to be served anywhere. That's not the, the remit of planning. Planning can say this building might be a hotel, this one might be a school, this one might be a church. It can't say inside those buildings these things will happen. So the role of planning in shaping the food environment is, um, is important, but it's um, not all-encompassing. And I think it would be <coughs> extremely helpful if more research was done into this. I mean, it's now 17 years since the Foresight Report <coughs> was published, um, and I think a lot has changed since then. We now have things like dark kitchens, supplying food for takeaways. Some councils are introducing planning policies around dark kitchens, but that's much more around the nuisance they might create to their neighbours rather than uh, the food they might be producing. Um, so to make, to make a significant change to the built environment, you need to have built environment professionals involved. At the moment, the, the, the concept of the food environment is not something that they're very familiar with. And so making it clear that um, they have a role to play in shaping the food environment, doing that through planning policy making it clear that focusing on supporting good health and reducing health inequalities are important and legitimate parts of planning and should be prioritised in planning policy would be helpful. Um, it, it is complex, the way that people use for built environments. Um, they've been described as systems of systems. And so one example might be that we hear from teenagers that the reason they go and hang around in um, fast food outlets is they're warm and dry and welcoming for teenagers. In other parts of the public realm, teenagers don't often feel so welcome. You know, what are you doing? You're hanging around on the street. Why are you hanging around on the street? Um, teenagers hanging around can be seen as threatening. So um, there's a question about, you know, where can teenagers go where they feel safe? We've heard a lot recently about um, perceptions of parks and green spaces and the way that young women often feel very unsafe there. So where are they supposed to go after school, if, particularly if they live in an overcrowded home? So these are very complex issues. The built environment has a role to play in it, and I think we need to understand more about that. 
but it also need, means joining up a lot of different policy agendas. Mm -hmm. And I think councils are well placed to do that. And if we look at places like uh, Oldham, where they've got a project called Northern Roots, which is, um, was initiated by the council, and it's an urban food growing um, project. It's about five minutes from the centre of Oldham. They grow food, and they also provide skills. Um, it's good for the climate. It does multiple different things. And I, th I think that's part of the problem, is that a lot of this involves multiple different policy agendas, different departments. It involves a lot of joining up. Um, and in a whole systems approach, the, the built environment has its role to play. Built environment professionals need to understand more about what their role is in shaping the food environment. Yeah. But their role is always going to be one of uh, a, a small system. Thank you. Before I go to Lord Colgrain's question, which follows very nicely, I have to say, from what we've just heard, but uh, Julie's just mentioned dark kitchens, and I wondered if Alice and Nikita have any brief comment about them. It's a very recent development, isn't it? <clears throat> Alice? Yeah, so, I mean, it is <clears throat> something that's significantly concerning for us because I think that it is preventing us from the actions that we've potentially taken in the past. So I'm very lucky in Gateshead that we have some really proactive and um and sort of thoughtful planners. And so we've done quite a lot of work around um, you know, a, 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 in our local plan, we have something around reducing the availability of unhealthy food as one of our health as part of our health criteria. But actually the the emergence of these dark kitchens are preventing us from being able to take some of the action that we have taken on hot food takeaways that I can comment on later on in in the in the discussion if you're interested. Okay, thank you. Any comment on that, Nikita, before we move on? I think um, just to say what's kind of emerging for me, I think Henry Dimbleby spoke about this in his session, is the um, like the unintended consequences that can happen when you take one action that you think is going to um, create a positive impact on food environments. The food industry will find a way to wiggle around, and I guess for me it speaks to the fact that like we really need comprehensive change that really signals and prioritises that children's health is what we're focusing on here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Lord Colgrain. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. My question is, uh, what role can local authorities and partner organisations play in developing healthier food environments, and what are the barriers to effective action? And Nikita, perhaps we, you could start off. You talked about schools earlier. We've had um, comments directed towards us about the proximity of fast food outlets to schools, um, deliveries of fast food to schools, <coughs> ice cream vans being parked outside school gates at, at uh, break time. Um, what can local authorities do about this sort of thing? Yeah, so I um, know that our partner School Food Matters and Chefs in Schools spoke a lot about that in their session. Um, and I guess the main point that I want to kind of focus on today is that there's loads of action that local authorities are taking to step up and prioritise children's health. But actually, if we want to reduce inequalities and ensure that kind of children's health is prioritised across the UK, then national government need to be stepping up and taking a role too. And it's good that you mentioned schools because I think um, one of the ways that we can kind of really maximise the opportunity for children's health through schools is about increasing access to free school meals and the quality of food. And our partners of so the council are doing a lot of work locally to um, make school food amazing in Southwark in the absence of national um, action. So Southwark Council for over a decade has been funding universal primary free school meals. In the last year they've extended free school meal eligibility to children on universal credit in secondary schools and we've been working with them on a school food transformation program where they have hired a school food improvement officer and they're um, looking at a range of mechanisms to drive up the quality of school food in Southwark so that includes training for school business managers to really signal that they have an important role to play in school food and making sure that it's healthy um, supporting schools with procurement so that they they have access to the skills and expertise to make sure that what they're kind of procuring in school food is actually healthy because it's going to be a, re a real challenge for schools where their expertise is not, is not in this area. Um, and most importantly, they're thinking about monitoring and accountability to ensure that standards are met. 
Um, and, you know, it's fantastic that Southern can do that, that we as a partner organisation can support them to do that. But it's not right that other areas of the country, that children going to school in other areas of the country don't have access to that. And so um, really important that government extends eligibility to free, to free school meals immediately to universal credit but ultimately long-term universal free school meals we think is important um, but that can't happen without monitoring and accountability around school food standards so just very quickly on can we have the other witnesses yes, no, first, sorry, sorry, Brownus, just very specific boycott if that. you don't mind Julia. Uh, i don't think i've got a lot to add thank you it's quick okay. Alice. Alice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. And I think the focus in local authorities needs to be an approach which is health in all policies. So every single policy decision that's made by a local authority should consider the health impacts. And if they are positive health impacts, then we can seek to maximise them. And if they're negative impacts, then you can seek to try and mitigate against them. So it's kind of a foundation and a starting point that every decision needs to be considered against health and the impact it has. Um, you know, in, in Gateshead, we were one of the first local authorities to restrict the availability of hot food takeaway, takeaways, but it was in recognition that we already had more than most places in the country. So in some ways, we were, you know, kind of closing the stable door after the horses bolted. But what we did in Gateshead was we said that mm -hmm. it wasn't just around the availability around schools, but we looked at where children and young people congregated. We looked at where there were high levels of obesity. We looked at whether there was an over proliferation of um, hot food takeaways already, and we looked at clustering of hot food takeaways. And working alongside our planners, we have since 2015, we have not had one single new hot food takeaway agreed for Gateshead. And actually what we have seen is a reduction in the overall number of takeaways in the area. Um, you know, there, there were issues with this, and I know that other colleagues that have done similar things elsewhere in the country haven't been is successful because there is a variation in the inspectors. So we were challenged by one of the big companies, if you like, that actually don't provide hot food takeaways. They're classed as restaurants because they provide seating. Um, but they have more money than we have at local authority level to challenge some of these things. And we were lucky that the inspector that looked at our supplement, supplementary planning document actually upheld our position. Whereas I know that there are other parts of the country this has not been the case. And this variation for local authorities is un unfair because the work is, is exactly the same. Um, you know, I, there's loads of other good work that's going on across the country. I've already mentioned the work uh, with the Transport for London, and there are several local authorities in the country that are looking at restricting sponsorship and restricting advertising on council-owned property. Um, you know, again, this is something we are starting to look at in my own local area, but we are limited, um, as, as one of the previous uh, questioners asked um, earlier on in relation to, you know, actually local authorities are really struggling financially at the moment. And so any sort of financial impact that that has on, on budgets is, is considered really seriously, as you'd expect us to. It does limit what people are prepared to do. There are some loopholes currently in the full food school standards in terms of academies and free schools between 2010 and 2014. That needs to be closed. We need to have another review of uh, food standards in schools and make sure that the children and young people who are receiving food in, in, in our schools where we are, you know, responsible for, for them are receiving the highest quality food. And I absolutely agree around the extension of free school meals, you know, again, that needs to be done nationally, really, because local authority budgets are so stretched at the moment. And then finally, the final point I would make, um, and there are probably many others, is that community development and using a community development approach where you look at the assets in a community and you work with the community and voluntary sector partners who are already embedded and trusted by those communities to understand what the issues are for those, those people living in those places and also to enable them to find the solutions themselves. You know, often when we're flying into a community where we don't have an understanding of the context in which people are living, it you know, it, we provide solutions that we think would be right for us when in actual fact the community themselves need to have a role in shaping the decisions that are made, um, you know, within their own, own, own communities and their own spaces. And again, there's some great examples of work like that going on up and down the country. Thank you. I have supplementary questions from Baroness Boycott and uh, Earl Caithness. Okay. Uh, my question is from Nikita. It's brilliant what you've done in Southwark. It's fantastic, especially extending into secondary school with universal credit. But how are you paying for it? Because you get money from the guys in Tommy's Trust. 
We are a charitable foundation. We have an almost £1 billion endowment. And so we um, use that endowment to fund our charitable work. But actually, the extension to universal credit in Southwark is because the Mayor of London has extended um, funding for universal free school meals across the capital. And so Southwark has been able to have freed up money from that being funded by the Mayor to extend to universal credit. So it's actually a choice by Southwark to invest in that. But, but many councils, it seems to me, um, Alice, don't have that choice because they don't have the money. I mean, like, we've got loads of councils. My council in Somerset's about to file 114. Uh, how do, how, how could, where would we get the money from? How would it work? Well, well I mean, that is an absolute is- issue, you know. So in Gateshead, it's about £1,000 per um, per resident in Gateshead less than we had back in 2015, you know. So we're we're grappling with significant challenges and... Um, alongside that, obviously, we've got the impact of, you know, the COVID-19 pan- pandemic and the unfair way that that landed in some of our most disadvantaged communities. We've also got the cost of living crisis. So, you know, supporting people through the um, the, the funding that we've got for, for the household support fund and the extension that we've recently had on that for, for a further three months, that this needs to be looked at in the longer term. You know, I do think that there are choices that we can make around, you know, the availability of, of resourcing. Um, you, you know, the twenty pound uplift that was given during the COVID nineteen pandemic that recognised the issue that families were facing, you know, again would need to be considered. Um, I, I'm really interested in in a piece of work that that's written by a guy called Grant Ennis, and I would advise you to have a look at, at his book around subsidy. So actually, the government provides an awful lot of subsidy to unhealthy food producers. Actually, we could reduce the subsidy that's provided to that food and use the money in a different way to do different things. He's he's the expert in that, so I won't go any further than that on that particular <laughs> point. But I think that there are choices that could be made Very much that we'll be able to tackle it. We will look at that. Earl Caithness. Um, it's following up Alice's point, and it's fit for Julia uh, as well. Of the current controls on planning for advertising, uh, strong fit for purpose? Or do you, as a local authority, want more power to control advertising? On the street. Yes. Is that to me? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, yes, we absolutely would like to have additional powers at a local authority level to be able to take some of the action on this. At the moment, we can take action on um, council-owned land and council-owned properties, Mm -hmm. but we don't have the ability to take action in other places. And so, obviously, when we take action in our own on our own council land, then it just pushes the resources elsewhere. And so it becomes a bit more of a challenge again at a local authority level where they're losing, where we're losing potential income. But it's just, and the and the exposure to the advertising is still seen by our communities. So we're, we're limited in the, what we can do at the moment in terms of protecting people from this type of advertising and exposure. Can you use it as a planning condition for a new billboard to say no ultra processed food advertising? I'd have to uh, um, pass this one to the, the expert in planning. Um, I, I would have to check that, but I don't think you can. And, and this comes back to what I was saying earlier about planning is quite a crude tool in all of this. It can sort of say where advertisements can go, but I don't think, and I will have to check, that it can say what sort of advertisements they are. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Can we move on to Baroness Gowdy, please? Very much. I'll start with Nicola. Um, and, and move around this way. Thank you very much for coming. I found this morning so interesting. Um, how effective are current local and national authorities to developing healthier food environments and reducing associated inequalities, including consultation with each other and joined up policies? So there's no duplication. Sure, yeah. So I'm um, going to give one example of national policy and one um, example of some work that's happening locally that um, I think is really fantastic. Nationally, I guess um, what we know doesn't work is voluntary um, action by industry. And the most powerful thing that we've seen happen over the last few years has been the soft drinks industry levy. So proper regulation through the taxation system that has forced industry to make change. And we've seen that while sales of drinks may have increased, actually the amount of sugar that's being sold through those drinks has massively reduced. I think it's about 35%. And I guess um, I think the takeaway thing here is actually the potential of tax and regulation and levies um, rather than, I guess, like the specifics. But we are working with um, 
other partners such as Sustain and um, the Food Foundation on our Recipe for Change campaign where we're looking at two options um, for a new levy on uh, cheap and healthy food um, and can tell you more about that if you want the detail. Um, in terms of a local example, I'd really like to shine a light on our partner Alexandra Road Charity. I don't know if you've spoken to them yet, but I really think that you should. Um, we've been working with them since 2018 in Lambeth and Southwark, um, and they as an organisation provide vouchers for fruit and veg to um, families living on low incomes with young children and those vouchers specifically are used in local food markets like Julia mentioned earlier um, and green grocers so it's a really fantastic example of actually how we create a really positive incentive for a local food economy um, and I was actually with a parent the other day who was telling me about how her daughter is now obsessed with fruit and veg she loves going to the market she loves picking all the variety or the colour and it's something that they simply wouldn't have been able to afford before. Um, and we know from the evaluation that that impact of variety of vegetables and amount of vegetables and fruit is being seen across families. So families who start the programme, about 7% of children are having their five a day. By six months in, 64% are having their five a day. Um, Alexandra Rose are also piloting fruit and veg on prescription with... Um, another partner AC Beacon in Lambeth and we're seeing really really positive results from that evaluation so just encourage you to reach out to Alexandra Rose because they're a fantastic organisation. It's really nice to hear such good things about a charity which one of our members Baroness Boycott was involved with I think is that right? Uh, I founded it. She founded it well that's fantastic thank you very much please continue with the question. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'll come back to what Alice said about the need for health in all policies um, we need to have health as a priority across a wide range of policies at a national level and at a local level. Um, if we come back to planning policy, it needs to be clear that a central role of planning is to create places where people can live healthy lives and that planning has a role in reducing health inequalities. And without those strong statements, it becomes much harder at a local level to do things because you're constantly having ind individual battles about individual places with individual bits of evidence and then it comes down to the, dis the discretion of planning inspectors and my concern is that what's happening is um, planning inspectors who are experts in the built environment but not experts in health and human behaviour uh, are sometimes ending up making decisions about how people might behave in particular situations and that's not really their expertise uh, so we need to have very clear statements in planning that um, supporting good health is, is a central and important part of planning because otherwise it will come down to these individual things um, and the other th part of that has to be saying that obesity is a national problem that needs to be tackled in lots of different ways by lots of different people. Um, if we come back to the discussions about hot food takeaways, at the moment it's possible for councils to limit their proliferation in places where there are already rather a lot of them. So it's sort of shutting the door after the horse has bolted. You have to say there's a particular problem in this place and a particularly vulnerable community. Whereas if we look across the national picture, it's a national problem. It's a problem for all communities. And, and that isn't strongly enough expressed in policies, including planning policy. Thank you very much. Alison. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, again, uh, everything that's been said, I agree with completely. Um, and, I, and I guess the restriction around planning policy as well, you know, so we've been able to re reduce the availability of hot food takeaways. This is defined by the proportion of food that's not consumed on site. So all people need to do is put a few tables and chairs out and it becomes a different planning requirement. It becomes a restaurant. And, um, you know, I'm sure that many of us would agree that lots of these places wouldn't necessarily be seen as somewhere that you would particularly go to go to eat um you know but there are the bits around the environment i think there's something around um the our hospitals and our hospitals uh sites in terms of you know not just the food that they're feeding patients while they're in hospital but actually if you look at the hospital environments they have also looked at trying to draw in revenue um by having you know commercial providers within uh within hospital settings and you know the obesogenic environment in some of our hospitals is 
really, really concerning. You know, but people are looking at this, I understand, in terms of balancing the profits um, that, the, that they're able to have to, you know, to continue working in the, in the hospital. From a ADPH perspective, you know, we think that the current strategy is not comprehensive enough and doesn't go far enough um, in terms of the ambitions around our food system. We do welcome the targets made by the in, in the independent review by Henry Dimbleby and particularly thinking about, you know, the reformulation tax, the introduction of mandatory reporting for large food companies, extending the eligibility of free school meals, expanding the Healthy Start scheme and setting clear targets um, to, that bring in legislation for that long term change. I think it's also important to recognise the reduction in budget that's ha that has happened in terms of public health grants at a local authority level. So it's just under £1 billion that would need to be returned to the public health grant um, for us to be able to take all of the action that we want to do at the local level. And often what you find is you find yourself focusing on those sort of more tactical things that you can do today rather than on the long term strategy that's needed really to address this as a particular is issue. So a real, real plea around reversing those cuts. And um, it, we've spoken about the skills as well. And I think there's something about the skills across the whole of the council. So again, if we're thinking about health in all policies, there's an opportunity for us to think about actually how do we ensure that public health skills are embedded across all of our directorates. And certainly we've got a planner in Gateshead who's currently undertaking her master's in public health as an example of work that we're doing to try and cross-fertilise that skill development. And I think that that would be something that could you know, be particularly interesting across other local authorities. Again, I know other, other colleagues are doing similar things, um, but being able to support that focus on actually what is health and primarily health is an asset to us from an economic perspective, from a social perspective, from a moral perspective. So taking that broader view of the role of local authorities in improving health and well-being, I think, you know, is, is something that I would really advocate for. Thank you. Uh, Lord Brooke has a supplementary, but can I just ask on that last point, did you find difficulty in finding the money from within the council to support the planning officer who's doing some public health training? So we were one of the local authorities that was lucky enough to secure funding from NIHR on the Health Determinants Research Collaborative. And the idea about that is to build research capacity and capability across the council um, so that actually we're able to deliver on health in all policies. So, yes, we were very fortunate in securing that funding, which has enabled us to take those steps. It's actually not just a, a planner. We have six people across the council in other directories um, doing their master's in public health so that they can ensure that health is considered in the work that they're doing within their directorate. Right. So there are pots of money available, if only you can find them. <laughs> yes. I think there are 30 local authorities now that have secured that funding. Good. Well, Chair, mine's really a follow up on your question. Oh, OK. And it, it's uh, principally to Julia, as you're an independent organisation that can make representations to anybody who might wish. Um, you talked uh, very interestingly about how uh, people are not always geared to look at what is causing the problem because their job description does not permit it as such. And you've got to try and get them to work on a wider basis and take into account the problem of health. Do you ever make representations to the Treasury? Because it's the Treasury at their heart and at the end of the day that controls the purse strings and this is all about money at the end of the day. Uh, yes. Um, the try and make health have higher priority in the way that they look at their spending. Because at the moment, health is the biggest spend, of course, for the budget. Yes. Uh, the, well, we presented evidence to the um, Department of Health and Social Care Select Committee recently about um, the role of planning in the built environment in helping to prevent poor health. And Have you um, thought about the Treasury's role we, in it? We perhaps should think more clearly. And if you have a contact at the Treasury, you think we should speak. <laughs> We'd be delighted to have that conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Can we move on to the next question from Lord Krebs? Thank you very much, Lord Chair. Uh, we are running out of time. And in a way, you've um, covered the points that my question uh, addresses. But perhaps I could ask each of you in turn to just um, offer advice to us on what you think would be the two most effective strategies for improving the local food environment, reducing inequalities, and in offering those two suggestions, tell us what evidence supports them. So start with you, Julia. Gosh, um, I find this one quite 
difficult because I think a lot of it comes down to local resourcing and we've heard from Alice about the, the problems of um, getting that local resourcing. Health needs to be a priority across all departments and I come back to the health in all policies um, view and it, it's very difficult with um, public health having had very large cuts and uh, planning having had disproportionately large cuts to get people to do that joined up system wide thinking that's absolutely vital because everybody's very focused on their own little narrow workload and we need a systemic change that's going to require lots and lots and lots of different things to be done and that requires people to step back from their day-to-day -day workload to make cross connections to make links and um, to think um, ab about the system as a whole and their role in it and it's extremely difficult to do that if you've got your nose to the grindstone so I think it comes down to resources I'm afraid okay. um, there's policy which I've already mentioned but there's also capacity and resources um, sure, I guess the overarching point that I want to make is that whatever is done, you really need to centre the lived experience of families living in low-income areas and really think about what you can do to stem the tide of unhealthy, cheap food that's flooding those areas and really like increase the flow of the good stuff. Um, and very briefly, just want to say that smoking has come up a lot, and rightly so, because it's an amazing example of what public health intervention can do. But there's still inequalities in who still smokes, and we don't want that to happen when it comes to healthy, affordable food. So if I, if I can only have two, um, one that I'd really want to speak about is focusing on the convenience store sector. I mentioned earlier that families living on low incomes are disproportionately reliant on this sector, and I think they're often left out of the conversation. Um, locally, we've been working with uh, Rice Marketing, so the council, to look at how we can support independent, wholesale, uh, independent convenience stores working with wholesalers to increase the proportion of their sales from healthier products. And we've seen that um, retailers can actually increase the availability of healthier options on the shelves by 22%. And that um, working with Best Way, who is the wholesaler who's been involved, they've increased their sales of healthy items by 18%. So we're showing that it's possible on a local level, but you know the resource to do that locally when things could be thought of nationally to incentivize that industry. Um, and yeah, the second one, just want to repeat myself, but the power of school food. Kids spend so much time in schools. It's a really important environment for them. Currently, there's 900,000 children who are living in poverty across the UK who don't get access to a hot, nutritious lunch. So I would immediately uplift the eligibility criteria, but with the ambition for it to be universal, to see the real benefits um, that can come from school food. And But that has to come alongside quality assurance, otherwise it, it's not going to have the benefits that we want. Thank you. Alice. Alice. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, I'll start again with health and all policies, and this is at a national level and at a local level. And a good example of uh, cross-governmental department working is the Joint Combating Drugs Unit, which has brought together a whole range of colleagues from across government at a, at a national level, and then it's replicated again at a local level, which is asking everybody to consider addressing the issue from their perspective. And I think that this, an approach like this would be really helpful in ensuring that the Treasury are able to hear from the evidence that's been provided by the Department of Health and Social Care, that you've got all of the other departments that have an interest in the food environment and the food interest industry involved and, and sharing the same understanding of the problem and the challenges and the potential solutions. So health in all policies, like I say, national and local. And then just, uh, again, reiterating the point from the previous speaker was around you know, there is some real strength in community led approaches, you, you, working into our most disadvantaged communities, allowing communities to have a small amount of resource to find some of the solutions themselves. So the project that I described earlier on that happened in Gateshead, they set up their own healthy pizza um, provision on a Friday night. It became, you know, something that was established in the community that was sustainable and that actually with a little bit of pump priming enabled the community to come together and solve some of the problems themselves. So if I had money, again, that I had, that we've lost over recent years, that's where I would put my investment in Gateshead. It wouldn't just improve 
the offer around healthy food, but it would allow communities themselves to have the opportunity to solve the challenges that they're facing rather than having those solutions imposed on us by well-meaning people like myself. Thank you. Thank you. Lord Brooke. Very quick. Uh, could we have a copy of the Gateshead report, please? <laughs> yes, and certainly. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you were restricted to two ideas, but if you've got more, please do send them to us. Please don't feel limited uh, to two, really. And we do have a few minutes, actually. Um, well, I'd like to thank you all three very much indeed for a really interesting session this morning. I'd love to come up to Gateshead and see what you're doing mm -hmm. up there, Alice, if we only had time. Um, can I, in thanking you, remind you that you will see uh, a transcript of this morning's evidence. If there's anything that needs correcting, please let us know. Um, my Lords, we'll continue with our next evidence session panel shortly. And in the meantime, I now draw the first public evidence session of this meeting to a close and the public element of the meeting is suspended briefly. Good morning everyone, it is just morning before noon uh, and welcome back to this public meeting of the House of Lords Committee on Food, Diet and Obesity. We continue our meeting this, this morning into the afternoon uh, with the eighth evidence session of the committee's inquiry exploring the role of foods such as ultra-processed food and foods high in fat, salt and sugar in a healthy diet and in tackling obesity. We're hearing today now from Professor Amelia Lake, a Professor of Public Health Nutrition at Teesside University, and Professor Maria Bryant, also Professor of Public Health Nutrition at the University of York, and they're both joining us in person. And we're also joined by Professor Wendy Wills, Pro Vice Chancellor and Professor of Food and Public Health at the University of Hertfordshire, who is joining us remotely. You're all very welcome, and we're looking forward to your evidence. I'm going to be asking you to introduce yourselves briefly when you, just before you answer the first question. Today's meeting is being broadcast and a written transcript will be taken for a subsequent publication. It will be sent to the witnesses to check for accuracy. I refer to the list of members' interests, including my own, which are published on the committee's website and we set them all out in the committee's first evidence session on the 8th of February. I also repeat very briefly what I said at the beginning of the earlier evidence session. Whilst it would be inconsistent with Lord's Committee procedure to compel our witnesses to do so, we will, for the sake of transparency, be giving our witnesses the opportunity voluntarily to declare any interest that they deem relevant to the work of the inquiry the first time they speak. So having done that, I will ask the first question and remind you to just give a brief introduction, if you would, before you answer it. And the question is this, how does the prevalence of poor diet and obesity differ across populations and demographic groups, and what are the reasons for the disparities? Maybe we could come to Amelia first. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I am a dietitian and a public health nutritionist. I spent most of my career in academia. Um, as well as being a Professor of Public Health Nutrition at Teesside, I'm also Associate Director for FUSE, which is a centre for translational research in public health. So working closely across policy, practice and with the public. And so my research ranges from topics as broad as food environment through to food insecurity, as well as obesogenic environments, which I know you've been talking about in the session earlier, um, healthy planning, workplace health, energy drinks, and um, also food taxes. So you have set out for us a very big challenge because that is a very big question. And I know you've had lots of evidence from a range of people over the, the past couple of weeks. And, you know, it's obesity is now something that is population wide, but there are more population groups that are particularly affected by obesity, food insecurity and wider, wider deprivation. I know that the three of us will, will think about different groups and I suppose related to the research that we're doing in Teesside, we're particularly looking at people who are living with severe mental illness and the fact that they are more disproportionately likely to be living with obesity, as well as more likely to be being affected by food insecurity. 
Thank you. Uh, Maria. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm uh, from the University of York, where I'm a professor in public health nutrition. For the most part, my research focuses on early life, childhood, and families. Um, and so that's predominantly through prevention research. I'm also the outgoing chair of the UK Association for the Study of Obesity. So thank you for inviting me today to give evidence. Um, just really extending on what Professor Lake has said, I mean, the, um, the rates of obesity now, let's, let's make this very clear, there's more people who live with overweight and obesity compared to those in the population who don't. This is a substantial issue. Um, and we know there are huge disparities as well in those living in the most deprived neighbourhoods. And particularly in my area of interest, focusing on children, one in five children now start school already experiencing overweight or living with obesity. Something happens in primary schools that goes to one in four. This is not equally distributed. If you are a child living in a more deprived area, you are twice as likely to become somebody living with obesity. For those children with severe obesity, you're four times likely to live in a deprived neighbourhood. So it's certainly not an equal uh, condition. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll let uh, Professor Willis talk to, uh, talk to you about other areas, but I'm very happy to come back on anything specifically in those. Thank you. Professor Willis. Would you like to briefly introduce yourself and answer the first question? Oh, we haven't no. got your sound. Can the broadcasters just check? Now you have a microphone. I think you have sound now. It's changed. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Yes, I'm Professor Wendy Wills. I'm a registered nutritionist in public health, and I'm also a sociologist. Um, and I work as Professor of Food and Public Health at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, I'm also the director for the East of England of the National Institute of Health and Care Research, Applied Research Collaboration, the ARC. Um, and the East of England has a very vibrant regional food and nutrition um, group, some of whose work I'll, I'll draw on today. And I'm quite happy to declare I have no financial or other industry conflicts that um, are, are relevant to this committee. So I've been involved in research on the wider determinants of food, diet and obesity for the last 25 years. And my focus has been sort of on that sort of lived experiences of socioeconomic status or social class um, or life position, um, and particularly in relation to families with children. Um, and a lot of the qualitative research I've, I've led or been involved with is, is secondary school aged children and their families, um, but also sometimes younger children. And I do a lot of work as well with older people uh, where the pattern in is a little bit different. Um, and today I will mo mostly focus on um, children and families. Um, and I, I was also going to draw on the same statistics as Professor Bryant has just talked to you about in terms of the National Child Measurement Programme and sort of children starting primary school versus when they leave and just the difference in prevalence and how um, the rate changed to such an extent that by the time children in England are leaving primary school, 30% of them, if they're from a deprived background, are living with obesity um, compared to 13% in the least deprived areas. So it really is quite stark. There is something about the accumulation of um, socioeconomic factors that change and accumulate throughout the time that a child is at primary school that's really quite worrying. And I, I, I will draw, as you ask the other questions, on some of our research that tries to sort of help understand that, what are the factors? The factors that might be driving those prevalence rates. Thank you. Do you think um, it, it accumulates as the child gets older because they have more choice themselves over what they eat? I think that's certainly the case when uh, children get to secondary school, mm -hmm. when they do suddenly find themselves in a whole new social and economic world, really, when they do often have a lot more autonomy, obviously, as they get older. And a lot of our research has looked at that in terms of the young people that start to go outside school at lunchtime, for example. Mm -hmm. So we see some real patterning there around certainly the, the food outlets that are available anyway near schools that are in more deprived neighbourhoods and the number of young people that go outside of school in order to purchase food and drinks. So, for example, in one of our studies of several hundred young people, um, around 40% of young people in more affluent areas were leaving school regularly, sort of more than twice a week to go and purchase food or drink outside at lunchtime. But this was more than 90% of young people who were at schools that were in deprived neighbourhoods. 
So not only were there more outlets, but mm-hmm. young people were more likely to go and visit those outlets um, at lunchtime. And a really stark statistic that we found or pattern that we found actually was in schools that were in deprived neighbourhoods where there weren't a great many food outlets outside. That we saw a typical pattern where a young person might have a hot drink before they go to school, drink water at, mid, at the mid-morning break, um, have an energy drink or a, another sort of high sugar drink at lunchtime and have no food whatsoever during that part of the school day. So if food wasn't available at home and they weren't coming to school with money or being eligible or taking up free school meals, Mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of food being consumed, which, of course, has has huge implications in terms of education, attainment, concentration, let alone health and well-being um, and obesity or malnutrition, in fact. In your study, did you find any schools that actually closed the gates and said you will not go out during the school day? We did not. Um, and obviously it was a small number of schools, large number of young people, but a smallish number of schools. And and uh, we know there are some schools that do that. That doesn't necessarily mean that those young people are then eating better or eating anything in school. It obviously just limits where they can go outside of school. And children are very canny in all our research. We always find they, they, they always find a way that they're only allowed out, say, at mid-morning break, but not at lunchtime. Um, or if their parents don't want them to go outside at lunchtime, for example, then they'll they'll buy food and drink on the way to school to consume while they're there. So it's not always a, a simple matter of sort of not let, letting them outside. Thank you. Baroness Browning. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, following on from what you've just said, has there been any research into grazing between meals? Because it seems that socially, um, particularly um, in, in certain areas, you have lost the fixed meal times. Now, that may be set in a school day, but obviously in the home environment, that, that all blends in. And of course, with very often work, hard-working parents sometimes holding down more than one job, children are left to help themselves, so to speak, uh, from, from the fridge and the cupboard. Uh, if you take just the set meals, and we're obviously very focused on what the nutritional value of those set meals is and whether it and how it contributes to obesity, but all that grazing in between, it, it, it's it's quite new for the current generations. It certainly was not available in my generation, which is post immediately post war when rationing was still on. And what happened between meals was actually usually supervised as a treat. Um, how much does this in-between meals grazing contribute to, do you think, the obesity problem? Uh, if you're, and sorry, because obviously I can't see people in the room, but if, if you're asking me that question, we haven't specifically looked at snacking. We know that in our studies in schools, many young people, the, the, the vast majority of young people, do tend to eat something at the mid-morning break. Yes. Um, but I don't have data on whether that impacts on overall energy intake or differs, or whether they eat less at lunchtime because they've had something to eat at mid-morning break. Um, we do know in terms of sort of uh, parents sort of overseeing what young people eat, we've seen very clear sort of, again, social sort of patterning in our qualitative studies of sort of more sort of middle class families um, almost having a different expectation about what young people will eat when they're in or out of the home um, and asking and expecting, not asking, but expecting that they prioritise sort of healthy eating, controlling weight more than we've found in families from sort of poorer socioeconomic backgrounds where the emphasis is on, you know, eat, make sure you're full full enough um, to get through the day because there are many more priorities in families from lower socioeconomic groups. Mm. Um, And we've called it in some of our work, the sort of hierarchies of worry. There are many, many things that worry families from lower socioeconomic groups, you know, whether they're holding down employment, whether they're holding down multiple low paid, insecure jobs, whether they're managing multiple health conditions, whether their children are in trouble at school, there there are a lot of different factors and therefore they're less able and less likely to prioritise sort of exactly what children are eating because of the the nature of that that, that hierarchy of things that are going on that are really quite uncertain in their lives. And that's really quite different in in families from more sort of affluent backgrounds, more middle class, Mm -hmm. Where there is more security, more stability, and therefore it's it's somewhat easier 
to spend time thinking about how to prioritize healthier eating, how to instill that in your children about what the expectations are about, you know, being mindful of current and future health. I can see that Amelia is nodding and I think so so is Maria. Have you anything to add to that on snacking? Um, Well, certainly our dietary patterns have changed immensely, haven't they, over the years? That's true. I I, I agree. I don't think we've got that much data specifically looking at grazing and those outcomes. We have done some research where we've explored what happens across a typical school day for a child, and we've spoken to children, parents, school leaders, governors, etc., about this. And how a child experiences that journey does very much depend on how they start and the circumstances that they're in. So it's not just about the food that they're, they're provided and they're offered, it's all the other things that happen to them from the start of the day. So if you are um, lucky enough to live in a more rural um, environment, you are less likely to experience some of the exposures to marketing, to advertising, to food selling cheap and uh, attractive foods to children than you are if you live in a more deprived uh, urban environment on the whole. And time comes up again and again with this, regardless of who we speak to, actually, not just the parents. The schools want to do their best, but of course they've got competing priorities as well. There's only a limited amount of time that they have to provide the food, let alone to teach children about education. And parents living in sometimes quite hectic environments also tell us a lot that time is a key factor, as well as the environments that they are living in. Amelia? Um, and just to add to what both my colleagues have said, it's also considering those wider environments and that ability for, say, a pupil probably from secondary school to very quickly either on the way or to or from school, not just to buy mm. high fat food, but also um, high salt, high sugar food and access drinks that might be banned within the school, like energy drinks. So that broader environment and those are very patterned by deprivation. So children attending schools in different areas will very much have a very different day or exposure. Thank you. Baroness Jenkin. Yes, thank you. Um, our, our, well, my interests are on the website. Um, what is the relationship between food insecurity, poor diet and obesity? Um, should we start with you, Maria? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I guess I want to start, first of all, um, by making it quite clear that food insecurity, although it does include hunger as a key domain, it's absolutely not just about hunger. So food insecurity is about having access to safe and nutritious food. And I think that's really important in this question uh, and lends itself to us having a better understanding of why perhaps some people who experience food insecurity are also more likely to be at greater risk for health inequalities, including obesity. Um, And um, actually, most of the evidence in this area, Professor Lake has done with a a very brilliant systematic review, so I will let her talk about that. But there there are other pieces of research going on at the moment uh, in this country exploring this very issue uh, and the mechanisms through which uh, food insecurity is linked to um, uh, obesity and other um, diet-related diseases. Uh, We have a a brilliant UKRI-funded food systems transformation project, um, uh, and it's uh, funding a a number of programmes, including one called uh, Food Insecurity in People Living with Obesity. They have recently uh, just um, uh, uh, provided the results of a survey of 600 adults living with obesity um, and um, asked them about some of the strategies that they were employing throughout their day-to-day lives. Um, And they found that those uh, adults with obesity um, that had also had food insecurity uh, spent a lot of their time budgeting, uh, thinking about supermarket offers and thinking through um, cooking um, uh, resourcefully. But actually the one thing that was most important uh, was budgeting um, and that in itself was linked to uh, having a poorer quality diet. So um, Maria just referred to a systematic review that we had quite recently published. So um, the systematic review looked um, at international evidence and basically the findings are that if you're experiencing food insecurity, you're one and a half times more likely to be being affected by obesity. So we're, we're now at the point in terms of the evidence that Food insecurity is a well-established driver of obesity. So it's 
you know that that's that's our I suppose that's the academic assumption that that is a driver and now what we need to do is address it and you know we have this complex problem around um, insecurity which you know when you're food insecure you're not just food insecure you're fuel insecure you're probably living in poor housing you probably don't have much in terms of the inability to cook food or the ability to um, have the fuel to cook the food so it's it's a wider a wider systems problem which I know is where Wendy's expertise comes in so it's yeah it's it's an issue that needs further attention and we need to be more aware of this um, link between the two while we might be aware of it academically we need to see that translate into thought about how we address that thank you Wendy yeah, just to, to, to build on that, I think we're all in agreement, really. I mean, food insecurity, obesity and poor diet are all outcomes of the same underlying causes. Um, and we almost don't need to look for sort of separate links or, or what the exact relationship is. Um, and for example, if you look at the Food Standards Agency, they run a monthly consumer tracker survey. I was just checking up on it this morning. And I mean, the, the, the three things that still concern people in this country are food prices, food poverty and inequalities and ultra processed food and the 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 people in in the UK who are most likely to have these kind of worries are people with um, a limiting disability or a limiting uh, health condition households with children and households on low income which in the FSA survey tends to be less than 20,000 pounds and of course many people that are on a low income um, may also have health conditions and uh, disabilities. They may, may also have children. So all of these things sort of become compounded. And it's it's a vicious circle of the factors that are influencing both their food insecurity and their diet and their obesity outcomes. So we almost do need to move beyond that now, as, as Amelia has just said, um, and look at what might work, what's driving it, but how can we overcome these complex factors that are part of everyday life, but that are socially patterned. That's the key thing, really, that there is a socioeconomic gradient about such things. Thank you. One of the organisations that tries very hard to address food insecurity is the food banks. Um, to what extent are they able to provide nutritious food uh, to the people who need to come to them? I, I notice that when I go past the donation box in my local supermarket, it's mainly processed food in there, yeah. and you can understand why, because people don't know how long it's going to be before it gets to the recipients. But is that an issue? Again, we've done um, some systematic reviewing around the quality of food and food parcels. So they, on the whole, were quite poor and less able to deal with people who have special dietary requirements like people living with diabetes or you know a whole whole host of other diet related um, conditions so we have food banks but actually food aid is much broader than food banks so we are doing a lot of work around social supermarkets and I know Maria is doing the same so there's you know that that's a different environment usually using surplus food again the kinds of food that come into that tend to be uh, longer shelf life or at least they're the more popular sources of food that that go out um, and even when for example in in Middlesbrough the um, social supermarkets are called eco shops to destigmatize and make it about reusing surplus food Within those, when you provide free fruit and vegetable, they're not taken up. And our, our research is showing that the the reasons for that are multiple. But what are, when you're just cooking with a kettle, mm. what are you going to do with a potato? So that that's the harsh reality. Mm. And you know, my our research means that I'm privileged. I can go into those environments, and it is heart wrenching to see the queue of people waiting for those shops that might only open a few days a week mm. and our work is saying people want these shops to be open more often they tend to be pop-up shops 
that this is a whole different food system that actually we know very little about very little about and this is feeding people this is feeding the people that we're talking about today mm. and we need to understand more and run by volunteers who are amazing but you know that this is we talk about food systems and we think supermarkets but actually this is a whole different food system that's happening I think one of our members knows a fair bit about that Baroness Boycott did you have yeah, a point yeah I'm the chair make? of Feeding Britain and we, I mean, when I was at London, we opened the first social supermarket on the back of the cemetery in West Norwood, and we've now got 273 of them. And uh, you're actually right, they pop up. They're not all run by volunteers because the notion is to make them sustainable. Some of the ones that are brilliant, they have bakeries attached and they have staff, and we managed to balance it out. Um, I'd slightly dispute with you the, the thing about fruit and vegetables not going. In most of the ones that I stay in regular touch with, we find fruit and vegetables and fresh produce go really quickly. That actually, if you can put the right stuff in front of people at the right price, mm. they'll go there. I um, agree. They yes. really will go there. Yes. And all our social supermarkets, as I say, it's a completely new, it's a sort of middle ground. It's, um, we teach cooking. It, it's part of your deal of joining the club that you learn how to cook, even if you've only got a kettle, which is really depressing. But um, you're right that it's, it's, it's a sort of different kind of more respectful model and they all have, ni- they have good names and they all have cafes. There's one, for anyone who's here, I went to one which is 100 yards from here yesterday mm. and I was going to propose that we all went there for tea. <gasps> I and think we should. It is completely amazing. It's in the Abbey Centre, which is the old public baths of Westminster, nice. next to the Cinnamon Club. Oh, yes. And it's absolutely extraordinary. Are you going to take us too? <laughs> I will take everybody. Perhaps we should arrange a little I visit. I didn't know it existed. Anyway, it thank is you. a social moment. But um, thank you, thank you for bringing them up. We may not be able to manage a formal visit for the whole committee together, but we, we, I think individually we may very well accept your invitation. Thank you very much. Can I move to Baroness Pitt Keithley, please? Yes, I, I want to come to uh, Professor Wills first on this to, to uh, ask you to expand more on what you've said about health. Um, because uh, I want us to focus on how food, diet and obesity affect health outcomes. And I'd appreciate it if you could talk about health outcomes in the very wider sense, Um, uh, uh, please, all three of you, when we come to you, and the role that the food environment plays in those health outcomes Mm. and how they're disparate for for different groups in society. Mm. Thank you. I can try to. I can probably say more about the second part of that question than, than the first part. But I mean, the, the socioeconomic differences in diet that, that are sort of well acknowledged, really, in evidence also show that, that that is linked to high levels of obesity, as we've already said, to type 2 diabetes, to cardiovascular disease, and also to malnutrition, because, of course, poor diet doesn't only lead to obesity, it can also lead to malnutrition, sometimes at the same time as obesity. Um, malnutrition doesn't always present itself as, as um, being underweight. It can be, you can be overweight as well as malnourished. So, and there there is a lot of epidemiological and other research that we can send in the sort of links to so that you, you can look at that because there is a lot there about those health outcomes. What's less clear, I would I would say, is the impact on sort of multiple health outcomes and people living with multiple conditions, because this is a really complex area. And this is a, slightly aside from my own sort of um, expertise and, and background in research. But but looking at those complexities and how if you're living with um, type two diabetes, as well as cardiovascular disease, as well as arthritis, as, as well as other conditions, it's it's how that accumulative effect also then obviously can impact um, on um, how those conditions are managed, um, it, you know, in combination. Um, in terms of the food environment and the way that that um, impacts on people, um, I wanted to draw your attention. We, we, we did a study um, in Stevenage in Hertfordshire through the ARC East of England where we really wanted to get beyond getting young people to think about the the immediate factors that might influence their own and their family's uh, diet, weight, well-being and their wider health. So we spent a lot of time talking to them about what's it like growing up in your town? You know, tell us about your everyday life. We had great fun sort of talking to them about that. And then when we went back on a a different occasion, said, now let's try and think through how some of those factors that you've raised 
could influence whether somebody is overweight or impacts on their health more broadly. Um, and once they'd got their head around linking those things together, it was it was so informative the way that they sort of brought to life um, what the, what their lives were like. So, for example, they might want to go swimming with their friends after school, but they realise if they've got younger siblings or others in the family who also wanted to do that, that their parents wouldn't be able to afford for all of them to be able to do that. So it had to be sort of rationed who who could access those things. They wanted to access the things like basketball courts, um, football pitches, gyms where teenagers might be welcome rather than turned away. But sometimes it was um, an issue of funding and being able to get to those things. But often one thing that really surprised me was just how often they brought up sort of um, antisocial behaviour and crime and their both their perceptions of those things, but also their experiences of people around them. So, for example, they would say, I've got a bike. I could cycle to the football pitch, but I don't have a lot for my bike. And I don't want my bike to be stolen because they know that that's what happened. Or to get to the basketball court, I have to go on the underpass. It's not a safe place to go at night. The, the street lighting is inadequate. So we're too worried about going there and also getting my bike stolen um, or running into encountering others that they didn't feel safe around. So quite uh, many of them said sometimes for them and their families, this is both their siblings and their parents, why would we go out? It's easier to stay at home. We want to be physically active and we want to support our own health, but there are all these barriers in the way. They talked about fast food outlets um, and we asked them a lot about, about that. A, and I know someone at one of your earlier um, sessions, it might have been Henry Dimbleby um, or Chris Van Tulikum, but talked about the sort of vouchers on bus tickets. We found exactly the same thing mm -hmm. in Stephen. Young people saying... If they had the money for the bus, they would use the bus. But they were really quite outraged that their bus ticket had a voucher on the back so that they could get um, a, a burger from a fast, oh, wow. a particular fast food chain, you know, at a discounted price. Because they were saying, you know, how dare they almost? You know, we're young people and other people that use the buses don't have much money. It just makes them more likely to buy that food. They were quite rightly asking, why isn't it a voucher to get free fruit or free vegetables at a local shop, but of course it never was. But they also wanted to point out that their use of fast food places wasn't often just about the food. In fact, it was rarely about the food. It was a warm, safe space that they could hang out with other friends and teenagers where they wouldn't be hurried on, where they felt that they could chat and hang out in a warm space. And as they pointed out, places that sell healthier food, A, don't open late, uh, like the fast food outlets, but also they're not welcome to stay there and just hang out and only spend, you know, 99 pence on a burger um, or a milkshake and just chat with their friends. So those, those sort of social rituals around where young people went, um, as well as their sort of fear about crime and antisocial behaviour were, were quite eye opening, actually. And they did come on to lots of solutions, which I can uh, can come on to later. Mm -hmm. And one more thing that I wanted to outline, um, which, again, was quite stark in our studies in schools, in the schools that were in lower socioeconomic areas, um, areas the, the staff in food outlets around schools built up a really good relationship with young people. Young people were a really important part of that lunchtime economy um, before, during and after school, actually. So they knew they would, you know, the they knew young people's families. They'd seen them grow, the children grow up. They were part of that sort of area, that neighbourhood. So it was more than just about buying the food. And we didn't see this at all in areas where it was um, more sort of um, affluent. The shops around schools then were actually much more um, business-like, if you like. They didn't have a personalised relationship that they built up with young people. It was go in, make a transaction and leave. So, again, I think the way that the food environment was almost pulling young people out of schools because of that nature of knowing who the people were in the, in, in the shops that they went to um, was really quite eye opening, again, actually, as to how that food environment was playing into inequalities if you're from a lower socioeconomic group. Thank you. And to you, uh, Amelia, the, the health and then the environment. And if you, there is any evidence about the effect of obesity and food on mental health as well as physical yes. health. Well, I was just going to say, you know, we know that um, people who are living with mental illness are more likely to be obese. 
and then there is also evidence around obesity and the, the mental health impacts and you know our children and young people at the moment are, are living through a mental health epidemic post-covid so it's something we need to be mindful not just of physical health but also mental health and you know, Wendy's listed nicely all the you know the comorbidities associated with obesity but another one is um, and I have to look at my sheet it used to be called NAFLD non-alcoholic fatty liver disease it's now called MASLD which is metabolic associated steatoic liver disease and that is the most common liver disease worldwide and that is associated with obesity and in the UK we are going to particularly in our deprived areas again it's patterned with deprivation it's in Chris Whitty's report this is something that we are just going to see an additional burden in terms of health services dealing with this where this could be avoided by well many factors including including lifestyle so I, I think well we could have a whole session on the health outcomes and obesity but I'll stop there so in relation to the food environment and how that affects health outcomes was that your question yes. okay so we have been looking at how the food environment affects behavior and therefore how behavior affects health outcomes and building on what Wendy has said that food environment is very much patterned by socio-economic deprivation. So we know that people living in more deprived areas are not only going to be subjected to more unhealthy food environments, we know that, we have the data. Um, it was last collected by Public Health England before they became OHID, so we have that data. But we also know that as well as the actual food environment, they are more likely to be seeing advertising for unhealthy outlets, be that outdoor advertising or um, at bus stops. We've done a, a nice piece of work in Middlesbrough and Redcar looking at what's being advertised in bus stops. So this broader environment, um, we have some bits of legislation that are not quite... Um, they're there, but they haven't been put in force yet around advertising. But we need to, to think more broadly about that wider advertising environment, which impacts on the food environment. And, and that includes what Wendy just talked about in terms of the, the bus tickets. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just starting with the first uh, one, I'll start at the beginning, really. But it's something we haven't talked about so far. Um, and that's the impact that it can have during pregnancy. Oh, yes. So um, if you are a woman who experiences food insecurity and or obesity, um, you're more likely to experience adverse pregnancy and fertility outcomes. You're particularly more likely to experience hypertension and gestational diabetes. Um, and in fact, um, you are eight times more at risk of getting gestational diabetes. Um, if you are a woman living with obesity, and this is particularly bad in the UK compared to other um, European countries. Unfortunately, we also see higher numbers of maternal deaths in particular populations, and women um, from black backgrounds in particular are at greatest risk of this. Um, and then, of course, uh, during childhood, obesity used to be something that you thought of as uh, a risk for adult obesity. We now know that not to be the case. Uh, and in fact, we did a uh, systematic review and a meta-analysis a few years ago now. And again, it was liver disease, actually, that came up um, most pr prominently in children as, a, as them being of greater risk. We also now see children with type 2 diabetes. Uh, we didn't see that before. And even our daily admissions to hospital, of which there are many, over 300,000 in terms of diet-related diseases, some of those are children as well. Proportionally a lot less, but there should, there should be none. So in terms of the environment, um, of course, the environment is really important. Uh, it interacts with uh, many other factors, including our kind of biological drive to eat um, uh, but it really then influences the what not just what we eat how we eat when we eat how much we eat when we can stop eating um, and of course as others have said in the most deprived areas we are uh, there are more prevalent um, uh, there's more prevalent sales of foods that are frankly cheap with no uh, with no nutrients in what's really important here though is acknowledging that in addition it's really hard to ask access 
healthy food, affordable healthy food in, in, in those environments. I think that's, that's important. It's both, both sides of the coin. And of course, healthy food does cost more, regardless of how you look at it, whether you look at it by calorie or whether you look at it per portion, it costs more. Uh, and this is, this is getting worse. You know? So uh, the weekly food basket has gone up 25% uh, since 2022. Uh, and other ind indices of food insecurity are alarmingly increasing over recent years. Food, food uh, free school meals uh, entitlement has gone up from, um, I think it's 19% to 24% since 2019. So this is, this is a significant uh, rising issue. Quite frankly, though, our settings are really unhealthy. Our public settings are super unhealthy. Our schools, our workplaces, even our leisure centres... Uh, we still see vending machines in schools. You know, this is unnecessary, and it's obviously driven because of profit. Um, so you know, we do face multiple challenges, of course, in these areas, but I think that's where I'd like to, to leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Baroness Boycott? Um, yes, I wondered if I could ask Professor Amelia Lake a bit more about this liver disease, which I don't know much about. Um, what, what foods specifically are causing it? How young do children get it, and how prevalent is this? Okay, so I think as a as a condition, um, I'm not an expert in it. I, I'm assisting colleagues in the, in the area, but I, it was it was news to me, and I do now remember reading that mm -hmm. um, review. So I think the children are children are getting it in adulthood, isn't it? As opposed to are we seeing liver disease? We're in seeing increased risk during childhood. During, yeah. yeah. But um, th this is a, it's often misdiagnosed or it's not diagnosed correctly. So there's a lot of misunderstanding around it because liver disease is associated with alcohol intake. So it's one of those new frontiers, I guess, in in public health where there, there will be experts in it that have said this, this has been around forever and it's related to um, a range of other metabolic conditions. But as somebody who works primarily in public health, you know, this is a new frontier for <laughs> me in terms of how we think about this is going to be quite a massive wave of people, primarily from an obesity perspective, that the end result will be this liver disease ending up as a, as a hospital admission. Maybe you could point us towards the people doing the kind of cutting-edge research well, on this, because yes. it seems to me it's not that well known. Yeah. And a, a very quick question to Wendy. Um, Sustain in London ran a campaign to make healthy takeaways, because all the things you said, and another thing we always found, it was safe for women, actually. They got you from a, from a streetlight to a streetlight coming home, and so you want them to stay, but you want them to be healthy. It wasn't fantastically successful, have you tried anything similar and had better success? Um, no, but I know of other sort of um, attempts at sort of the healthier takeaway model, as it were, and, and where they're positioned, I think is really important. But, but I think what drives people to go and eat at a takeaway um, overrides whether they're going, they're looking for healthy food, because quite often they're not. It's that sort of yeah. feeling of that it always being... That always makes you think that, in fact, because they go for other reasons, you could, you could in fact, sell healthy food for that. Uh, no, I think it's worth trying. But, I mean, takeaway or chains like Leon, for example, um, you know, that, that's exactly what they have done. But I suspect that that, again, is very socially patterned as to who's accessing those kind of chains versus, you know, McDonald's or, or KFC, etc. So I, 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 it's really difficult one to tackle, I think. Um, yes, in terms indeed. of very driving good. people to go to a healthier outlet, even if they were available. Very briefly, yeah. we need to think about what we do. Those outlets are everywhere, and most of the time they're run by local people. It's yeah. a lo local business. So we did some work, and it's called the Foodscape Study, where we looked at what were alternatives. So we worked with um, people who supplied the packaging, and we, we worked with them to provide a lighter bite box for yes. fish and chips, mm -hmm. reduce calories, lots of people like that. We... Um, looked at the number of holes in the salt shaker salt <laughs> significantly changed the number of holes significantly reduced the salt and we ran what we called master class courses which were being run by Kirkley's council and we copied the model and took it up to the northeast and it, you know businesses change behavior so i 
but that's that's very much local authority run and but working with what you have because you know th- those those businesses are there and people like a takeaway but will they notice how many holes are in their salt shaker i'm the one that does every time <laughs> every time i go in but uh, but other people don't so there there are so I, I, I completely agree with you. We got we got the main chip supplier into London to move their large, medium and small, change the designation of the boxes, because everybody bought medium. So we made small, they agreed to make small, medium. Yeah. And it, it did just that's, reduce. That's like and, and, but it, anyway, it's a kind of, you know, whether you can legislate, it was very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> it's pressure, perhaps, rather, rather than legislation, I should imagine. I think we do need to move on to Lord Colgrain's question. Okay, nice. Lord uh, I beg your pardon, Lord Caithness. <laughs> thank, thank you, Lord. Uh, quick question for, first for Professor Bryant on her opening statement. Would it make any difference, material difference, to statistics whether you measure children on BMI or waist to height? You've been listening to the news today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it would. And, and how we measure all of these things has a very big impact on what the data look like, for sure. Um, we... It, the one thing that I need to make quite clear is what we do in one circumstance doesn't always work for another. So, for example, on an individual level, a clinical level, probably you wouldn't want to just use BMI. So BMI is literally your weight that adjusts for your height. It is a proxy, but very much a proxy for obesity. It doesn't measure adiposity. So, yes, it would make a difference. But on a population basis, which is, I think, what we're talking about today, it's, the, the, it's a well-established uh, and perfectly suitable measure. And for children, um, I think it would be quite challenging to, to use other measures in that, in that school setting, quite frankly. So um, I know that there are some discussions about the National Child Measurement Programme, um, but I think that it is without that, without that data, we really wouldn't have a good handle of what we're talking about today. Thank you. That's very helpful. My, my question, I'll start w- with you, is what we sort of slightly covered a lot, lot of this ground. What are the main drivers of food poverty and inequality in diet? And can you say a little bit more about our welfare system? Certainly, I can. Yeah, I was going to do that anyway. So, um, I mean, I think we've already said this is no longer marginalised. Again, it depends on when you're collecting the data and how you're collecting the data. But we're looking at between 20 and 25 percent of our population at the moment experiencing food insecurity. It is substantial. I've already told you about the figures for free school meal um, entitlements. Now, remember that to be entitled for free school meals, you have to earn less than £7,400 a year. So we are talking about people on extremely, extremely low incomes. Coming back to the food banks, there is now an estimated more food banks in England than what there are Asda, Sainsbury's and Morrison's all put together. And, And that's the ones that we know about, by the way. So this is a substantial wider system. Um, And we also know that some groups are, of course, more vulnerable, uh, particularly um, families with children, but particularly families with very young children uh, tend to be quite vulnerable. And, yes, there's wider economical, social uh, drivers to this, poverty, low income, uh, unpredictable income, etc. But specifically related to food, we also know that that the cost of food, particularly healthy food, has risen considerably um, uh, for for a number of reasons and and partly related to the cost of living crisis. Um, So you asked me to talk specifically about welfare um, and and we are, in my research, we're working quite a lot in this area in terms of free school meal. Uh, But I think what I'm going to say applies uh, to to other areas. There's two things here. The cut-offs for eligibility are too low. They're far too low. Uh, we've got evidence ourselves showing that when we talk to children about food insecurity, who quite frankly are often more shielded than their parents, they are experiencing food insecurity at a degree where they're... And these are children that do not qualify for free school meals. £7,400 is a ridiculously low amount, and that definitely needs... That's something that we can, that's something that we can, that we can work on. We also know that there are barriers in accessing welfare. Again, this is about free school meals, but it isn't solely about that issue. Um, So on the whole, people have to apply for their welfare. 
Um, and so what we know from quite dated data now um, is about 11% of families who are entitled to free school meals do not apply. That's about 250,000 families, okay? Um, and we've been working uh, with uh, Sheffield Local Authority who have worked through um, a system whereby they're using the data that they already have on those families on their circumstances to automatically put in a process whereby they can be registered to receive those free school meals. This is a low-hanging fruit. This is something that we don't need uh, to invest too much time thinking about. We're now working with over 30 local authorities they are really committed to doing this, but they are working very, very hard. In the early findings that we're getting, we're seeing thousands of extra fam families getting uh, eligibility, all those children getting a hot meal, and millions of pounds being invested into the schools in, in pupil premium, and schools certainly need it. So I think there are some uh, relatively low-hanging fruits in that area. Could you write to us what, what you think the uh, eligibility criteria ought to be, if you reckon it's too low? Well, quite frankly, I would say it should be universally provided. <laughs> However, uh, there is a call for those on universal yeah. credit to receive uh, free Thank service. you. Professor Willis, any comments? Yes, thank you. Just to add to that, I mean, I agree. I think looking at the sort of widespread adoption of, of free school meals um, would, would write an injustice, in my view. Um, you know, children go to school they have to go to school we want them to go to school they ought to be fed when they're at school irrespective of what their parents income um, is and children themselves have got a very keen sense of social justice and they they see their friends at school and friends of friends who and they know you know they've told us in interviews and focus groups you know that their mum's not poor enough they don't get free school meals like I do and they know that those children are either going hungry or having to go outside and, and buy a, a bag of chips. Um, and I'll, I'll, there's some recent research been reported from my colleagues at the University of Essex, which does show that the universal free infant school meal system does have a modest impact on obesity and BMI outcomes, particularly for um, children who wouldn't meet that that threshold, that criteria that Maria just referred to, so who we might call moderately deprived and you know, not deprived enough to get the free school meals, but under the universal infant free school meal scheme, they are getting fed, um, and there is a small um, impact, but you know significant impact um, on their obesity levels. And the authors um, of that research sort of hypothecate as well that that could be because they're not bringing in. Uh, packed lunches. Packed lunches do tend to be higher in calories than the food that they would get through uh, free school meals and therefore it's having that sort of control but also making sure they eat. So they're not having a packed lunch, they're getting the universal infant free school meal and it is having an impact on uh, BMI. So I think it's something that if we can go in that direction of the more children that are eligible to be fed at free at the point of being at school then the better in my view. Um, just to add to, to both my colleagues' comments, I think we also need to consider people who are um, considered as in-work poor, so in-work poverty, mm -hmm. yeah. and I think that then covers you know, that, that lack. So there are lots of people that are working. Um, the stigma attached to using food banks or even the social supermarkets, and then therefore that has impacts on, on the, the wider family. So, yeah. There's Thank you. A brief follow-up question from Lord Very Brooke. Brief, we have two more questions to get through. Just on, on the, um, you made a reference there yeah. to the uh, school meals, and you said hot meals. Are they in fact all getting hot meals, or in fact are some of the schools providing back meals? Let me to answer that. Yeah, uh, yes. They are, on the whole, all offering a hot meal. Um, whether or not they're taken up is, a, is another thing. And what ha tends to happen is you've got some very well-meaning people who recognise uh, the children. Some children may not want the hot food and they will provide them a sandwich or something else like that. But they are offering, they are being offered. Lord McCall has a question. Yes, could you uh, tell us what are the scientific parameters that distinguish poor obese people from obese people who are not poor and is it, how easy is it to correct the deficiencies that such an investigation would reveal in poor obese people? 
I'm not sure I understand your no, question. As in poor, as in socially, um, socioeconomically poor in well, terms you, of lack of... You were saying that obese, the, the poor people who are obese can be malnourished. And I just wonder what the scientific parameters are that distinguish the two groups. Okay. And, and if there's any way of correcting them. Okay. Wendy, is that something you wanted to take around malnutrition and obesity? I think that's quite hard to yeah. uh, answer, I have to say, in terms of the numbers who might be obese as well as being malnourished. Um, I'm not sure I can give you a sort of adequate answer to that question, I'm afraid. I mean, we do know a little bit about food intake in in those circumstances. So people who have obesity tend to have diets that are are lacking in nutrients that they would need. So we certainly know that they're less likely to eat their five a day, not that many people do, quite quite frankly. Um, They're less likely to consume uh, oily fish. Um, and more likely to consume sugar-sweetened beverages. But again, that's kind of mixed up in this kind of wider social and environmental uh, determinants. Thank you. Can we move on now to Baroness Boycott? Um, Chair, would it be OK if I kind of concentrated on national approaches yeah, here more than local? Because I think we've done quite well so far on local. Yep. So the question really is how effective are... If, it, if local applies, bring it in, but national approaches to developing healthier food environments... Um, can I start with you, Maria? And I know you. I, I completely agree with you about the FSM, and you know that it should at least extend to people on universal credit. But what other things do you want to see a government doing? Well, I'm just thinking back to the, this question in particular. I wanted to just make it quite clear as well in terms of the evidence because there has been a, a large focus on trying to uh, change people's behaviours um, and, and at a population basis as well in terms of a, a education. Um, and on the whole, they, they have been f- fruitless or uh, increased inequalities, actually, because it tends to be those people that uh, are in a more privileged situation that, that takes them up. However, we can still do something if we think about uh, multi-component interventions in that space. I think actually that the, the way forward is to support people to actually uh, interact and manage the system that, that they're living that they're living in. Um, but the population-based approaches um, that tackle the wider determinants uh, that, that's where we see the strongest impact on health inequalities. Mm. Um, and so we have some, some relatively good evidence on some of those, and I think the, the, sugar, the sugar tax for, for sugary drinks is, is, a, is a good one there. There's also some um, systematic reviews in this area as well coming out. Uh, one came out of uh, Liverpool where they looked at different types of policies. So they looked at policies that addressed price, uh, they looked at uh, taxes and, and subsidies for, for that. Um, and then they looked at place and environment policies um, as well as personal kind of dietary counselling um, advice. And uh, universally, the thing that came through as most beneficial are those that tackle price, both in terms of taxes uh, and subsidies. And again, this is coming back to the two sides of the coin. This is a, not just about uh, targeting um, the unhealthy foods, which I still think we should, but it's also about promoting the, the, the attraction of, of, the, of the healthier foods. Um, I think as well there's lots that we can do to um, move some of the policies forward in schools as well. We have uh, WHO guidance, we have levelling up priorities that state whole school approaches to food need to be adopted. We do not see this. Um, and this is not this is the fault of very, very busy schools, by the way. Uh, they can't prioritise whole school approaches to food. These universal messages that go throughout the day, in, in addition to the food that's being offered, but the food education, learning about where food comes from, learning about how to cook, consistent messages so that we're not using food as a reward, those kind of things. Schools just have other things, and they are now faced with having to deal with English and maths, quite frankly. So I think there's something that we can do about uh, UK uh, UK uh, school food policies as well. How would you promote healthier food in in the current system that we have? I mean, would you say that the government ought to spend a certain amount of money advertising it? well, subsidising I mean, it. marketing of food is a, is a very persuasive thing. If we, we, I don't quite frankly think we have the resources for that, but certainly those in, the industries that do, they, they, the substantial benefits. I think we have to go back to the evidence that says that price is key here. So taxing and subsidising healthier foods. Um, Amelia. Thank you. Um, 
In addition to Maria's comments, we are, we are one of a group of three studies that are looking at new ways to think about food tax. Mm -hmm. And that work is currently underway. Our research is in working with stakeholders at a national level in terms of what would be acceptable, and that's now moving forward into economic modelling. So there, there is going to be more to think about, and tax is a dirty word, but actually we need to think about it, again, like Maria said, both, both sides of it. And the sugar leg levy has been successful in terms of reformulation, and it has influence the food industry to change what is on offer to consumers so again this we need to think not at an individual level this is not about changing individual level behavior we need to change the environment in which people make their choices the other lever we could use and i know your session this morning was about planning um, and i i'm sorry i haven't haven't watched it so apologies if this is repetition but there are planning levers that can be thought about in terms of helping to shape that environment. So moving away from just thinking about reducing um, fast food outlets. So you had Alice join you from Gateshead and Gateshead they've got, you know, we've published research showing that their three pronged approach successfully reduced those number of um, takeaways and that looked at their childhood obesity data. So if they applied, somebody applied for planning in an area that had a higher than national average rate of childhood obesity, it would get rejected. But we also need to think about bringing on board the planning inspectorate for when these go on to appeals. And again, we've done some work in that area as well. So we need to yeah, be, be more creative with, with our levers that are there. And I know you know a lot about the whole question of advertising of sports drinks and the targeting of kids. Can you say something about how that works at the moment in our society, that Red Bull sponsors the rugby and, yeah, so we, and it, we've, gets under the, it gets very young kids, doesn't it? So Maria also mentioned that marketing and advertising is a very powerful tool. Of course it is, otherwise companies wouldn't use it. And one particular interest of mine and my colleagues is around the marketing, advertising and uptake of energy drinks by ever-increasing young children. Um, energy drinks are drinks that typically contain sugar as well as caffeine. Um, and these are everywhere. They are part of young people's culture in terms of, as you said, sport, music, extreme sports, anything that's cool. And um, we've had a promise to look at how those are sold. They do say on them that they are not to be sold to young people, but again, that's down to the individual. You know, what we've, we've got quotes from uh, children that we interviewed in County Durham saying, if it says it's not for us, why are people selling it to us? Why does it have so much sugar, something like Red Bull? Does it not seem to get through the sugar levy? I just am um, puzzled. It, well, th all of them have a range of drinks with sugar, with um, low sugar, but yeah, they're still still available. And some of them, some of them are quite pricey and out of the reach of children. But there are a lot of brands that are cheaper than water. So, and they become part of meal deals. Um, I can't. Okay. Comment on that, but not to my knowledge, mm. uh, because of the, the age restrictions. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't. We haven't. No, we can haven't check on that. that. Mm. And yeah. Amelia, you mentioned some research, um, some research that's ongoing. Yes. I realise you can't give us the results, but it would be interesting if you could give us the remit and the methodology. Would that be in the public domain that we could see? Oh yeah, I will. I will forward all the that links. There, be, there are yeah. three studies. That's the food tax work. Yes, that's currently that ongoing. Would be very so, yeah. Interesting. Thank I will you. do, yes. And Wendy, Wendy. What, what would you want to see nationally that could support all the local efforts or make mm. changes? Thank you. Yes, Thank just, you. just a couple of things um, beyond what my colleagues have already mentioned. Firstly, I think is um, looking at minimum income standards. And there is research conducted by my, my colleagues at Hertfordshire and elsewhere, sort of looking at what do people need to live on that would, you know, from salaries as well as from welfare benefits that would mean they could live at a reasonable level, which would mean that they were more able to afford mm -hmm. um, food needed to, to support health. So I, and I can send the links to that about minimal income standards. 
But the other thing I wanted to talk about was our whole systems approaches. And Maria talked about whole school um, approaches, but I think whole system approaches to things like obesity. So this is when we look beyond the individualistic level, beyond public health, beyond health, yeah. and really look at where within a system, and although it's local, this should be applied nationally, to look at what partnerships are needed, what understanding of how town planning, public health, education, libraries, the fire service, you know, all these different elements, people working in partnership, which is in line with integrated health and care systems that we have across um, England now to really address what is a complex issue of obesity. And although it's too early for evaluations of outcomes when whole systems approaches have been put in place, I've been involved in some process evaluations, sort of looking at the, the enablers to making a whole systems approach work, which we would hope will lead on to better outcomes later, um, and been involved in this in Scotland, England, and now Northern Ireland. Um, and we did a review of existing evidence for the Northern Ireland government, um, which looked at um, what, what evidence was available. And it did show that whole systems approaches are starting to be associated with some improvements in body mass index, in supporting better physical activity environments, better community well-being and when whole school approaches were part of those broader um, whole systems approaches then they were particularly effective and there there is effective schemes in place with outcome data in the US in Australia in the Netherlands um, and one small part of London there is one study where there is some evidence of that so that's something that I think we could advocate more that has to happen, has to be evaluated, that we have to see local authorities and other organisations within an area working in partnership and aligning their, their vision, their objectives, um, to have that end goal of having an impact on obesity in our communities across the country, because we can only address it by having this broad approach to working across a whole environment of where we all sort of live and work, etc. We can't only focus on behaviour, otherwise we're not going to tackle inequalities at all, really. Thank you. And were you, were you referring to Southwark? Um, it's uh, Goldbourne. So, no, not Southwark on that occasion. It's a study. I'll, I'll send Maybe the you links for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, can we move on to Lord Brooke and Baroness Browning, who both want to ask more about strategies? Well, we, we, we've, we've covered, we've, a we've covered it to a degree. I, I declare my interest. I've got an interest, too, in alternative, organic alternatives to sugar, uh, one in particular, stevia. Um, and that takes me to your identifying pricing as being a, a major factor there. Uh, you talk about taxation. We've got policies developing on taxation. We need more taxation. You mentioned subsidies. Where are the areas in which subsidies operate and have they been looked at extensively and could they be extended? I think we have a... I don't know an awful lot about the evidence base around subsidies. I'm uh, more familiar in terms of taxation, but um, I'm not sure. Are you referring to sugar, Lord Brooke? No, I'm referring to, for example, if the free, uh, free food, yeah. uh, free, free f fruit, uh, whether it could be subsidised. Yeah. It was something that they looked at in the systematic review, which I, th I believe was from Liverpool, that came out of Liverpool in 2015. Um, so, and I, they made particular note that it wasn't just the tax, that it, equally so, it was about subsidising to improve the uptake of the more yeah. healthy foods, yes. It's, it's something that has not been particularly strongly pursued. Uh, uh, and I wonder if there's evidence why it wasn't, or in fact, should it be? Well, I would agree that it would, should be, but I don't think, I, I agree with you, there hasn't been too much in that space. <clears throat> Wendy, do you have any comment on that point? No, I don't have any evidence to offer there either, I'm afraid. All right, fine. Baroness Brown. Yes, thank you. Just finally, the, the whole system approach that you've been talking about this morning is clearly a theme that we're picking up from the various evidence sessions that we are hearing. Um, people not wanting to disparage in any way the choices open to individuals to improve their health and obesity, but clearly that isn't enough for us to tackle the problem, and certainly as a leg legislative chair here. I just wondered, is there anything that is actually happening in Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland that is ahead of the game from 
this part of the country? I can answer that a little bit in terms of whole systems approaches because in Scotland and shortly, I believe, um, in Northern Ireland, they are putting funding behind helping local systems, as it were. And I mean, I mean, sort of working in partnership across local authorities and all the different sort of uh, departments and organisations that work in an area, supporting them to understand more about how a whole systems approach will work. There's a methodology called the Leeds Beckett, Beckett methodology, um, because Leeds Beckett University worked with um, when it was Public Health England on what do, what are the sort of components of a whole systems approach that you need, um, which is about you know getting senior buy in aligning um, sort of budgets and resources when you can for that longer term solution, making sure you have a certain number of workshops to really work through a meaningful action plan with smart targets, you know, things that are immeasurable. And sometimes small pots of funding, I think, can go a long way to sort of putting your money where your mouth is almost. And they are doing that in Scotland. And I believe that that is the plan in Northern Ireland to sort of make that happen so that they're almost held to account. You've had some funding. What are you going to make to happen? How are you going to monitor your action plan? When are we actually going to see some evidence that this is starting to have an impact on how um, that sort of joined up picture of how a local area is addressing obesity? And that needs to involve the community as well, which is the bit that often does get missed out, but is vitally important so that everybody's on, on the same page of where it's going. Thank you. And Wales, Wales are actively consulting at the moment around food environments and energy drinks. And next week we have um, a workshop that I'm attending where they're, they've, they've consulted and uh, I will know more next week, but that they have you know, a specific interest, food environment that we've talked today, energy drinks that we're, we are also interested in. So yes, thank you. Indeed, we're keeping an eye on that. Yes. Anything from you, Maria? Yeah, I think there's quite a lot of pockets of activity going on, actually. Um, I work quite closely with Bradford Council. They've been, um, they were one of the pilots in the Leeds Beckett method, um, and they are instig instigating something called Living Well. Um, so there's, this is crossing workplaces, schools, hospitals, um, including their own workforce. Um, we're just too early on the whole for our local uh, data to show us any impact at this stage, but there are some other systematic reviews in this area, and I'm really happy to share those with you, um, that do find that place-based interventions, interventions that cover multiple different places as well, different settings, are most likely to have an impact. Um, the WHO report, uh, the 20, no, it was the European Obesity Report, uh, uh, apologies, um, in 2022, also has a number of strategies that are listed that relate to whole school approaches. Uh, sorry, it's because I work in whole school approaches to food, in, sy in systems <laughs> approaches to for obesity, uh, and this is right from the from the start, so preconception, uh, pregnancy, early years, uh, into into older life, uh, and for each of those kind of part times in your life, they've got different recommendations for different things that can cover the whole system. So I'm very happy to share those with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wendy, you mentioned targets a minute ago um, in relation to small uh, local programmes and the targets are quite helpful. We've had national targets about reducing obesity for years and none of them have been met. And we've had many, many obesity strategies and hundreds and hundreds of anti-obesity policies but they don't seem to have worked. So I'd like to finally ask each one of you, why don't you think that, why haven't they worked? Wendy. I think my answer would be it is about whole systems. It is about working in partnership. Um, we, we can't tackle obesity and get the rates down by focusing on individuals' behaviour. We're all sort of grounded in practices um, that sort of draw on our sort of own histories and background and socioeconomic situation, but also the policies and levers around us. So we're, we're as individuals, we're part of complex systems. So it is only by taking that kind of approach that we might start to see a dent um, in the sort of prevalence of obesity. So I, I just think partnership working has to be the way forward to drive a reduction um, in prevalence rates. Thank you, Amelia. Absolutely agree with Wendy. 14 strategies, 700 policies are the other way around. Dolly's, Dolly Thesis work, yeah. It's mind-blowing, isn't it, that it is. we are where we are. And yes, there needs to be a way of thinking about those multi-component ways of working within systems. 
public health teams understanding planning. <laughs> you know, I'm a dietitian, but Super you know, we, we need to. Food environment determines what people eat. We cannot send somebody to a dietitian, give them individualised advice, and then send them out into an environment where they're bombarded with food advertising. So we need to think about that system, but in the context of the fact that people are hungry. You know, there's we we passed this morning coming here. There are mothers outside on hunger strike protesting at the fact that mothers and children are going hungry in this country. So what's being discussed in this room is so important, but we need we need action and we need our local authorities to have that capacity to deliver the action because what happens locally is so important about tailoring it to those populations locally. Mm. And those teams are being, you know, because of issues around funding and capacity, those teams are diminishing. Mm. So people are less able to deal with that planning appeal from a hot food takeaway or a a national takeaway. And, And those people are then stepping in and creating holiday food clubs, foundations run by a well known hot chicken fried brand provide holiday food activities and that's mm. where we're at mm. what do you think maria i mean it's kind of clear why they haven't made a difference those strategies because hardly any of them have been enacted as others have said i think that's really important and uh, what about follow-up and enforcement of those that have well that we don't really have that many apart from the, the sugar tax at the moment that we know anything about mm. Uh, but we do, we do know through things, not just in the UK but elsewhere, that these things have to be statutory. You know, I've actually been in a meeting with the Department for Education and two head teachers from schools who said, make us do it. Make us do whole school approaches mm. to food, otherwise we won't do it because we can't prioritise it. So we've got to get away from this notion of nanny states whereby actually people don't have choice. This is not about open choice we need to make everything accessible the healthy food accessible and we and the best way to 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 enact policies is by mandating them actually Mm. and Um, providing the funding so that absolutely yes i mean and then of course we do need to do something about marketing and and stop the delays and delays in doing something about marketing Um, and then there's those low-hanging fruits that i mentioned before about um, you know, paperwork not being a barrier to, 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 for people to, to get the support that they need and the welfare that they need. I do agree that local authorities have a really important role to play, but they are also in a really very difficult situation um, at the moment. Um, so they absolutely need supporting financially. Um, but sometimes things can be done centrally, and I think the free school meal auto enrolment. Uh, project is one of those examples where there's we very much are capable of delivering on that now. Mm. Can I just ask you a little thing about the auto enrolment issue of free school meals and that some local authorities are trying to do it? Is it costing them time and money to do it? And if it was done nationally, would that save them the time and money? as well as getting more children the food they're entitled to. Yeah, we have been interviewing uh, local authority representatives about this very thing and we're collecting data about how much time uh, they're spending doing it. First of all, they're all very happy to do it because they see the benefits, Mm. Um, but it's an unnecessary amount of time. Mm -hmm. And it also incurs time in the schools as well because the schools are supporting the letters that go out to parents, etc. So, you know, we, we haven't finished collecting the data, um, I'm happy to share that when, when we do, Please but we do. do have early findings to show that it is considerable, uh, but like I say, they are happy at this stage to do it, but they don't need to do it. Uh, it can be something that could be delivered centrally. You're very helpful to see that, thank you, very. even though it's early results. Thank you very much. Indeed. Can I thank you all three very much for all the evidence you've given this morning. It's been really very interesting, very helpful, and there's a number of things you've said you'll send on to us, and we look forward to seeing all that as well. And uh, remind you that the uh, transcript will be sent to you for any corrections you need to make. And, and uh, in conclusion, my lords, the public element of the meeting is now concluded. Thank you.